You're listening to a TVO podcast. The following podcast contains coarse language, descriptions of violence, and sensitive themes which may not be suitable for younger audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Previously on Unascertained. The real question is, were they doing what they were trained to do and following the training correctly? I am just thrown off by the um, leaving somebody face down and handcuffed to the rear. Like, you cannot leave somebody like that face down with their hands in the back. A second investigation into Fakiri's death has now concluded. But they say that we cannot press charges because we don't know who gave the fatal blow. That's a fake argument. In the criminal law, you don't have to prove that a blow, for example, was the cause of death in the sense of that alone did it. Newly filed court documents suggest that the guards who were restraining him in his final moments violated the use of force rules set out in their training. First and foremost, I want to sincerely thank everybody for coming uh, today. Uh, It's August 2020, and a humid afternoon in downtown Toronto. We're standing outside the offices of the Ministry of the Solicitor General. That's who runs Ontario's jails and the provincial police. Yusuf Fakiri and his coalition, which is named Justice for Sully, have organized a rally outside the ministry's offices. Dozens rallied this afternoon in downtown Toronto calling for justice for Suleiman Fakiri. This protest comes after the OPP declined to press charges against anyone involved in Fakiri's death. Almost every major Canadian news media outlet is here. Dozens of attendees wearing masks hold signs with pictures of Suleiman. Passing cars honk their horns in solidarity. And the Fakiri family are standing side by side as Yusuf takes the mic. Now let's talk about for a couple minutes about the OPP's decision. They effectively said to my family that we cannot press charges because we do not know which guard gave the fatal blow. What a shame and what a preposterous statement that stands and, sl- and slaps in the face of Canadian justice. Since I started researching this story, I've heard Yusuf Fakiri give speeches many times, but I had never seen him this fired up. We're not going to depend on the OPP to do the right thing, but Canadians to do the right thing, but Ontarians to do the right thing, because that's what Canada is about. That's what Ontario is about. Mental illness does not discriminate on race, on ethnicity, on socioeconomic class, or on gender. That's why every single Canadian has a stake in this story, ladies and gentlemen. Justice will continue until we achieve justice for Suleiman. The attainment of justice for Suleiman will be when the guards that beat him to death will be charged for their violent and criminal acts. I'm Yusuf Zin, and this is Unascertained. For the past year and a half, as I dug into this case, I'd been so focused on the idea that Suleiman had been beaten to death. But could that really be what killed him? Getting beat by guards, your your heart's pounding, you're hitting the ground, you got a knee in your neck. That's John Thibault, the eyewitness. Back when we interviewed him, I asked his opinion on what killed Suleiman. He's not an expert in causes of death, but this is what he had to say. You're in a very small cell, all that body heat for almost 15 minutes in that cell, imagine how hot it would be in there. You're cuffed, you can't move, it's almost like being trapped in a coffin underground. I know I'd have a fucking heart attack. I don't think it was any wound, I think he just couldn't breathe, man. I think they suffocated him. During the OPP's reinvestigation of the case, the forensic pathologists didn't change their opinion on Suleiman's cause of death. To this day, it remains unascertained. Just like the first investigation, the OPP also laid no charges, and the reason they gave the family was because they couldn't determine who gave the fatal blow. But I was more concerned with what was the fatal blow? In other words, the cause of death. Going through the timeline of Sully's death with former correctional officer Yosko Asenov, there was something he noticed. I I just can't imagine, like, why you would leave somebody face down. He's referring to the fact that Suleiman was left face down and handcuffed behind his back right before his death. 
and you know that a reality could be that people die. We literally talk about this and we study this at Corrections College. I mean, anybody who's ever been face down and if you put your hands behind your back and you're trying to breathe is difficult enough. I mean, especially if this guy's having like breathing issues, right? Like, I mean, he's probably exhausted fighting. It is not easy being in these situations, right? Like you cannot leave somebody like that face down with their hands in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that just, that part shocks me. I started doing my own research on the risks of being restrained while on your stomach. And it turns out, restraint-related deaths are not uncommon. Take this case, for example. Alongata was tasered, pepper sprayed, and tied up by police after he randomly attacked an elderly man in central Auckland in 2018. Shortly after, with a spit hood over his head, he was found unresponsive in a cell and later died. Alonada was a 29-year-old father-to-be from New Zealand when he was arrested for assaulting a stranger during an unusual erratic fit. Four police officers arrived to find he was agitated and yelling. The cops eventually tasered him and forced him to the ground, face down. The officers then piled on top of Nada, pepper sprayed him, and placed a spit hood over his head. Witnesses to his arrest heard him call out, help me, I can't breathe. They eventually restrained him and took him into a holding cell. In the cell, they kept him face down and applied pressure to his back, head, and legs. 20 minutes later, Nada was found without a heartbeat, lying on his stomach, hands and legs tied behind his back, and still wearing a spit hood. He died three days later in a hospital after being taken off life support. But because the pathologist couldn't determine whether the spit hood caused his death, not one officer was found criminally responsible. Well, I'm Jason Payne James. I'm a medical doctor and I, I'm a forensic physician. So that's somebody who often deals with criminal and legal matters, but predominantly in the living. While researching the Nada case, I came across Dr. Payne James from the UK. He'd previously commented on that case and agreed to speak with us about ours. I couldn't help but notice the striking similarities between Nada and Suleiman's restraints. I do investigate death and the events leading up to death, and I'm fairly familiar with most methods of restraint and uh, the background to how people are restrained and why they're restrained and the techniques used. What I also have a particular interest in is deaths in custody and how they're investigated, in particular by the state, and what the outcomes of those investigations are. I walked Dr. Payne James through the timeline of Suleiman's death the varying eyewitness accounts and findings from the post-mortem report to get his medical opinion. Well, uh, yeah, you've mentioned that there were large guards trying to restrain him, that he was placed face down. But I, I would imagine that the forensic pathologist in this case would have been looking for evidence to suggest there might have been, for example, positional asphyxia and, or, or other causes of death that occur in a restrained environment. Can you uh, just briefly explain what positional asphyxiation is? So positional asphyxia is where you're in a position that you are in effect crushed and that you can't get an adequate amount of air in and out of your lungs because of the anatomical structure of the body and the surrounding situation that you find yourself in, which may be, for example, um, being crushed in a crowd or being face down with your hands behind your back and with a number of officers or health professionals pushing down on you to try and stop you moving or getting away. Here's how Dr. Payne James described it. Our diaphragm, which is the main muscle of respiration, lies between our chest and our stomach. So if you're standing up and breathing in and out, your chest is usually what moves. But let's say you're sitting in a chair or lying down. Very rarely does your chest actually move in and out. Rather, it's your stomach that moves. The problem is that if, particularly if you're on the bigger side of your height, that if you're placed face down, your stomach is pressed against the floor and that limits your ability for your diaphragm to move in and out and to get air in and out of your breathing passages in and out of the mouth. 
Uh, and because if you're also restrained with some large people on top of you trying to hold you down, you also can't use your chest to expand and to get air in. I went back into the postmortem report to look for any references to this. The coroner, who dissects and examines the corpse, was unable to find an asphyxia cause of death from the body. Then there's the forensic pathologist, who examines those medical findings plus the circumstances surrounding the death, such as reports from witnesses. She also concluded that there was no evidence that asphyxia was the cause of death, but she didn't rule it out either. I guess, I mean, this is where I guess we get stuck because uh, he was about 30 years old and he was, uh, you know, a, a little bit over six feet and 250 to 300 pounds. I mean, there were conflicting narratives of uh, how he was left, but we do have statements that he was left in prone position on his stomach, restrained. And uh, also, I want to ask you about spit hoods uh, and pepper spray. Sorry, if we just, yeah. just get back to the... Um, being face down and you're a big guy. That is an absolutely predictable, in my view, risk of, of positional asphyxiation. There's no law enforcement agency in the world, I would suggest, that cannot be aware that that is a highly risky position to be in. And that if you have got somebody in that position, you need somebody at their head all the time to ensure that they are breathing, that their condition is good, that they're responding. So somebody needs to be with that person if they're in that position at all times? Uh, ideally, they shouldn't be in that position for any uh, length of time, uh, but if they are, you need somebody closely monitoring them. We know that the guards left Suleiman face down and hands cuffed behind his back before he was found without vital signs. It's unclear whether he was hogtied or not, which is where your hands are bound to your feet while you're on your stomach. A nurse's note questioned this, but we can't confirm it. The time he was left alone is not made clear either. The police report only says that they went back into the cell, quote, a short time later. Here's what the ministry policy says on leaving an inmate restrained, quote, Restraining an individual in the prone position, stomach down, with hands secured behind the back and leaving them in this position is particularly hazardous because of an increased risk of compromising diaphragm and lung function and increasing irritability of the heart, leading to sudden death. What about the use or the role of, of pepper spray and, and spit hoods? Uh, in, in this case, we know that he was pepper sprayed twice and a spit hood was placed over his head. As far as we know, we believe that the pepper spray was not cleaned off of his face at any point and the spit hood was placed over him um, and left there. Could that also contribute to sudden death? Well, you have to take into account if somebody is, for example, their breathing is already compromised by their position or by exertion, and just physiological changes of response to fighting or struggling, could it contribute? Well, in very broad terms, the answer has to be, well, yes, possibly. But can you quantify it? The answer is no. Spit hoods are an extremely common law enforcement tool around the world, particularly the type that was put on Suleiman. It has a mesh netting and bacteria filtering fabric, which prevents the wearer from spitting, biting, and spreading diseases. It's also got an elastic band that wraps around the neck. Both Alo Nada and Suleiman Fakiri were wearing this type of spit hood when they died. The use of spit hoods is growing around the world, including Canada, but they are also considered highly controversial. The United Nations regards the practice of fully covering the head of a person as cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. And often the, the, the reason for applying spit hoods is that it prevents infection of uh, officers from bites or spitting, although there is very, very little evidence that there are any significant numbers or, or any numbers at all of proven infections derived from uh, detained people spitting. Applying a spit hood without training can be extremely dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, things can go wrong. Here's an example. The jury has found two Halifax special constables guilty of criminal negligence causing death. 
In June of 2016, Corey Rogers died in a police holding cell while wearing a spit hood. The Crown argued the booking officers failed to carry out their duty to properly care for and follow prisoner care policies, while the defense argued the booking officers never received proper training on the application and removal of spit hoods. In this case, the police officers were charged and found guilty because their negligence was captured on camera. But one of the officers in the case claimed she had never even been trained on how to use a spit hood. Their attorney said that they were just tossed a box of spit hoods and off you go. But if they had taken a moment to read the label, they would have seen this. Warning, improper use of hood can cause injury or death. All caps. But if somebody's spitting or they've got blood from their mouth, or there's mucus coming from their nose, then it's possible that the inside of the spit hood is obscured enough and that there may be um, some possibility of that spit hood reducing the amount of air into an already compromised person. With all of these events, you know, the amount of pressure, uh, positional asphyxia, uh, the pepper spray, the spit hood, could all of those elements lead to sudden death? A big man struggling, being placed face down, having irritant spray applied, having a spit hood applied. Yeah. This was the closest I'd gotten to understanding how Suleiman could have died in that cell. And the more I researched, the more names I found that had almost identical circumstances to Suleiman. Resisting. Stop resisting. Stop. 2013, Stop resisting. Daniel Linson Bigler, 19 years old, Jacksonville, Florida. History of schizophrenia. Arrested after a psychotic episode. Became non-compliant with correctional officers in a jail cell. Strapped by the wrists, ankles, and chest to a restraint chair. Pepper sprayed, spit hood placed over his head, Cause of death, asphyxiation. Medical examiner ruled the death a homicide, but no charges laid. 2015, Natasha McKenna, 37 years old, Fairfax County, Virginia. History of schizophrenia, struggled with officers in a jail cell, restrained with handcuffs behind her back, legs shackled, spit hood placed over her head. Cause of death, cardiac arrest and excited delirium. No charges laid. 2020, Daniel Prude, 41 years old, Rochester, New York. History of mental illness. Restrained by police officers during an erratic state. Handcuffed, spit hood placed over his head, pinned face down to the ground. Cause of death, restraint-related asphyxia and excited delirium. Medical examiner ruled the death a homicide, but no charges laid. Yeah, the, 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 this is the kind of scenario that sadly you repeatedly uh, see in deaths in custody. None of these features, the risks to any of these features are, are not new and not unforeseen in my view. It all started to come together. The pepper spray, the spit hood, the prone restraint with the hands cuffed behind the back. But while Dr. Payne's explanation of positional asphyxia seemed possible, I was still a bit skeptical. That was until this happened. New information in court documents. New court documents show guards did not follow proper use of force protocols. The guards who were restraining him in his final moments violated the use of force rules set out in their training. In preparation for a civil lawsuit filed by the family against the ministry, Nader and Ted, who are the Fakiri family lawyers, have been undergoing what's called discovery. This is where lawyers examine evidence and interview key witnesses, such as guards, inmates, and anyone who's present at the scene. One of those people they spoke to was a sergeant from the Lindsay Jail who was there the day Suleiman died. In this podcast, we've chosen not to name the guards involved in Suleiman's death, despite the fact that they're public in court documents from the Fakiri family's lawsuit. So we won't name this sergeant either. We'll call her Sergeant Jane Smith. Sergeant Smith wasn't a part of the original escort, but she was one that responded to the code blue minutes later. She was also one of the staff that was fired back in 2018. 
On December 14th, 2020, the transcript of a conversation between her, Ted Morocco, and her lawyer was made public through the courts. We got our hands on a copy. The transcript is nearly 200 pages. Ted and Sergeant Smith discuss in detail the events of Suleiman's death. The conversation filled in a lot of gaps for me, mainly because there are several references and timestamps to the CCTV surveillance tape from the hallway of Eitseg. That tape still hasn't been made public, but Smith's play-by-play -play commentary gives us extremely detailed moments of what happened in the hallway, down to the second. Let's walk through it. We'll start at the code blue, the emergency call that alerts all available officers in the jail to come and assist. 20 to 30 guards show up, including Sergeant Smith. At 3.08 p.m. and 39 seconds, Smith looks inside the cell and sees the officer struggling with Suleiman on the ground while he's in the prone position. One officer is holding Sully's lower torso down. A spit hood is then placed over Suleiman's head. Smith claims in the transcript that she had no idea he was wearing a spit hood. Ministry policies clearly state that staff must decontaminate the eyes of an inmate who has been pepper sprayed before they apply a spit hood. But there are no references to Suleiman being decontaminated in either the police report or the postmortem report. Leg irons are now placed around his ankles while still on his stomach. This is a breach in policy as an inmate wearing a spit hood must never be placed on their stomach. At this point, Suleiman is now at risk of positional asphyxiation. As the present manager, Smith starts to take command. From 3.10 p.m. to 3.12 p.m., Smith removes officers that were originally restraining Suleiman. She describes them as overly exhausted and red-faced. Other officers from the Code Blue call take their place. Smith then gives the call to handcuff Suleiman from the rear, which makes his position even more compromised. According to the transcript, one of the main reasons why she was fired was because she did not attend to Suleiman after he was placed in this position. At 3.15 p.m. and 6 seconds, officers are stepping out of the cell, with Smith being one of the last. According to the transcript, she even says that Suleiman was being compliant and responding, saying, yes, miss. At 3.16 p.m. and 16 seconds, the door is closed, leaving Suleiman alone in the cell. Here again is another action that's contrary to policy. An inmate wearing a spit hood must never be left unattended. A minute goes by and Sergeant Smith stays outside the locked cell door watching Suleiman through the window. She assumes he would be yelling or moving, but he's not. She focuses on his back and notices it's not rising. At 3.17 p.m. and 17 seconds, Smith has the cell door opened and orders the guards to remove the handcuffs and leg irons and to turn him over. A medical emergency is called over the radio. When the guards turn Suleiman over, Smith says this is the first time she sees the spit hood over his head. At this moment, she notices the spit hood is filled with what she believes to be vomit. We don't know if Suleiman actually vomited or not. There are no references to it in the coroner's report. But if Sergeant Smith did see Suleiman's spit hood, quote, full of vomit, that means he could have easily choked to death. 25 seconds after Smith sees the spit hood, a nurse arrives and 911 is called. Minutes later, paramedics arrive at the jail, but at 3.47 p.m., Suleiman is pronounced dead. But here is arguably the most important moment to come out of this transcript. At one point, when discussing the spit hood, Sergeant Smith starts to get emotional to the point where they take a break. When they come back, Ted asks why the topic of the spit hood 
made her upset. She says this, quote, because I wouldn't have put his hands behind his back. When asked why, she responds, because you just wouldn't do that. It doesn't make sense. She's later asked about the pepper spray. Smith said she had no idea he had been pepper sprayed. He would have been decontaminated, she says, and his handcuffs wouldn't have gone to his back. And then comes the kicker. Ted says this, quote, Tell me if you agree with this. You would never combine the use of pepper spray with a spit hood and with a cuff to the rear position on one's stomach, right? Smith responds, yes. Ted continues, and the reason you don't do that is because that would be basically a triple threat risk of asphyxia. To which Smith responds, absolutely. that none of this is unforeseeable when you are restraining uh, somebody in the way that you have described Mr. Fakiri has done. And this is something that happens, uh, frankly, time after time, is where people are inappropriately restrained. This is Dr. Payne James again. But there is nothing new, as you rightly pick up, in the entirety of what's happened. To Mr. Fakiri, and in my mind, it's predictable. It's predictable if you put a big guy face down on the ground, spray him with spray, stick a spit hood on him. Well, that is clearly going to put him at risk of death. Everything Dr. Payne James told me had now been confirmed by the Smith transcript, the triple threat of asphyxia. But with all this knowledge, I still couldn't wrap my head around why the forensic pathologist kept the cause of death unascertained. When conducting a post-mortem examination, the goal of the forensic pathologist is to determine the cause of death. The autopsy, which is the dissection of the corpse, is extremely useful in doing this. The pathologist can examine the findings from things like organs, blood, and tissue but they will also try to reconstruct the circumstances and events which led to the death. Therefore, videotapes, photographs, and statements are extremely important. They then put it all together, like a jigsaw puzzle, interpret the findings, and come up with a reasonable reconstruction of events that led to death. Back in 2019, the office of the chief coroner announced that they were reopening this case due to new evidence found. During the OPP's investigation of that evidence, they went back to the original pathologist to ask if they wanted to update their post-mortem report. But the pathologist kept the same opinion. Despite evidence such as John Thibault's recorded and credible testimony, I wanted to know why. Why was it still unascertained? Every time I tried to get the ministry to comment on the case, I was always told they could not speak due to the pending coroner's inquest. A coroner's inquest is an open hearing conducted by a coroner before a jury of five members of the public. The goal is to create recommendations that, if implemented, will prevent further deaths. After the first few episodes of the podcast had been released, I tried one last time to reach out to the office of the chief coroner, expecting not to hear back. But surprisingly, Yes, I'm, uh, I'm Michael Polanin. I'm the Chief Forensic Pathologist for the province. And uh, my name is Dirk Heyer. I'm the Chief Coroner for the province of Ontario, and we co-lead the death investigation system for Ontario. While we weren't granted an interview with the pathologist who made Suleiman's post-mortem report, Dr. Heyer and Dr. Polanin are essentially her bosses. They both oversee all death investigations in Ontario. In fact, it was Dr. Heyer who called for the Fakiri case to be reopened by the OPP. They both agreed to give us an hour, and I had a lot of questions. So our program, our, our podcast is called Unascertained, and throughout our investigation of this case, I, I've come to understand a little bit more of what that term means. And so my understanding of that term is not that there is no cause of death, but that there could be more than one. Uh, is that a fair definition of unascertained? Well, I mean, it's it's a it's a good starting point. However, is there's to really understand what unascertained means, 
you first have to understand what we mean by cause of death. The cause of death is the actual process um, related to injury or disease that causes the end of life. And the manner of death is the means by which the cause of death occurs. So, for example, an autopsy can reveal that somebody dies of a gunshot wound to the head. But in the investigation of the circumstances surrounding death, the um, investigation may reveal that the person shot themselves or somebody else shot the person, in which case the manner of death would be suicide or homicide. Right. So we've been speaking with experts and medical professionals and reading through the postmortem report, it seems like there are pieces of evidence that don't necessarily align with that report. For example, we know now that there is a testimony from an eyewitness, John Thibault. He describes the physical altercation as a beating. He references blows, punches, kicks, but he also describes a, a knee on the neck. Was this something the forensic pathologist was aware of? So um, the sort of evidence that you're talking about, which is basically circumstantial evidence around how the cause of death may have occurred, and you, you made uh, reference to what could be uh, a contributory asphyxial mechanism. That's exactly the sort of information that a pathologist would would want to know to make uh, to factor into the decision making process. In addition to other things such as the position of the body, you know, the movements of the individual, sort of all of those details do become highly relevant uh, in um, in the process of deciding the cause of death. Right. So it, talking about, you mentioned the position of the body. Um, we, we know that Suleiman was left in a prone position. Uh, he had two layers of pepper spray on his eyes and face, uh, spit hood placed over his head and hands cuffed behind his back. His ankles were shackled. And he was left in this position for some time. But we now know that after an exhausting struggle with with correctional officers, um, is that a position that you uh, would say it, he was at risk of asphyxia or a restraint related death? Well, you know, I'm not going to comment on on the specific case because you know th those elements will have to come out in you know in a fashion in evidence. But I, I will tell you. That it is generally accepted in forensic pathology that restraint in the prone position is a risk factor for sudden death. What people debate is the precise mechanism by which that occurs. But, right. but there's no question that restraint in the prone position is, is highly correlated with sudden death. I guess uh, the reason I ask is because there was uh, a transcript that became public uh, recently of a, one of the managers who was present in restraining Suleiman, who said that she would have never made the call to handcuff him behind the back if she knew he had been pepper sprayed and, and a spit hood. Can, can those two elements as well, in combination with the prone restraint, uh, exacerbate or also um, lead to sudden death? I, I think we're getting uh, to, too close to the actual evidence of the case. I, I will tell you, however, that it is common for these for individuals who die in this context to have been exposed to a number of other stimuli, such as pepper spray. There are, there are a whole variety of things that can happen during uh, struggle and restraint, but. You're absolutely correct insofar as, you know, those are the sorts of elements that have to be considered mm -hmm. in the case. Sure. But can you comment on whether those elements were taken into account in the postmortem report? Because the opinion was unchanged during the OPP's investigation. I, I, as I said, you know, we're getting we're now we're now firmly into the facts of this case. Therefore, I can't sort of comment in a definitive way about those things. But those are exactly the questions that need to be canvassed. What is the role of prone position restraint? What is the role of pepper spray? What is the role of altercation and struggle? You know, all of these factors need to be plainly considered based upon the facts of the case. 
and and determine to, to as to whether or not they're they're relevant. So there's, there... there's a there's a there's a famous quote in the forensic pathology textbooks, which is that just because a pathologist indicates that the cause of death is unascertained by autopsy does not mean that the cause of death is unascertainable. In other words, the cause of death may very well be ascertainable if you enlarge the scope of evidence. I see. Okay. I guess I'm just trying to wrap my head around uh, some of these uh, these facts that have come forward about uh, the Suleiman Fakiri case that uh, haven't seemed to be taken into account in the post-mortem report. Yeah, you know, I, I think actually we have we have exhausted that topic. Sure. No, I, I completely understand. But I, I guess I mean you can understand that for the families and for the public who, who have heard a lot of these facts, it, it can feel like it can come a little late when you know we're waiting for an inquest and this evidence that seems so shocking and that, as you said, are the right questions to be asking are sort of not being factored in. So I'll jump in just for a sec, uh, speaking about the inquest process and the timing. Um, as I think you know, uh, we have been working to make sure we get that inquest going as quickly as we can. And we were in uh, stages of uh, preparing for the inquest and, and likely that, you know, we while we were uh, preparing for that, we recognized additional information that uh, we felt should be brought to the attention of uh, the investigating police service. Have either of you read the the postmortem report? I've certainly read it a, a number of months ago, um, not in the recent past. Would you say, Dr. Heyer, that it is um, that it is up to date? Not gonna I, again. Number of months ago, so I can't speak to up to date. Mm. But uh, but again, specifics of the case, I would be uh, not delving into for all of the reasons that we've talked about earlier. Sure. Not to avoid, but just to 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 be completely uh, respectful of the processes that are in place. Right. I guess for the family, you know, with all the information out there already, the question for them is more: When will all of this be accounted for? And I just just building one thing off of that sentence, recognizing that um, I completely hear you. Um, important to remember that the inquest will not be uh, answering accountability. Finding of accountability would occur, that cannot occur at the inquest. Right. I guess it's sort of my question then is, do you think uh, accountability is even on the table anymore? Well, I think you've asked those questions throughout the conversation uh, where there's the potential that accountability uh, processes could follow after the inquest. You ask those. Um, again, we we will openly uh, explore the facts publicly and the direction and the events that occur following that will be the direction and the events that occur following that. Right. I guess winding up, um, what would you say to the family who feels that unascertained is not good enough, despite what we know? Uh, I certainly uh, say to the family, my sincere condolences. Um, I hear them. Uh, I totally respect and hear the challenges that they're facing and uh, and, and wish that we could provide uh, the best answers as, as quickly as possible. As you could probably tell, I didn't quite get the answers I was looking for. They said they couldn't comment directly on the case. But when asked about the way Suleiman was restrained, Dr. Palanin did agree that the prone position is a risk factor for sudden death, and other elements like pepper spray are common in these types of deaths. They also agreed this type of evidence is exactly what a pathologist should be looking at. But the question I couldn't get answered is whether the pathologist looked at this evidence in Suleiman's case, and if so, why is it still unascertained? The OPP said that John Thibault's testimony was credible. And what about the statement from Sergeant Smith? That came out after the OPP's investigation. Was the pathologist even aware of her statement? Clearly I was asking the right questions. But they didn't want to look backwards to review what did or didn't happen. At least not publicly to me. They would only look forward to the coroner's inquest where they say all of these answers will come out. 
But whether accountability will result from those answers remains to be seen. That inquest is set to happen in the coming months. So, here we are. At the start of this podcast, I said that we were going to try to answer three crucial questions. How did Suleiman Fakiri die? Why was no one held accountable? And what happened during those 11 days? Throughout my investigation, speaking to experts and eyewitnesses, I've learned so much more about the case than when I first started this. But some answers have continued to elude me. And clearly there are people who know things about Suleiman's death that we don't. For me, it always seems to come back to unascertained. The word literally means not made certain or unknown. And I think that's fitting for this case. Because if you can't tell how Suleiman died, how can you tell who killed him? But consider how Suleiman, a man with 11 years of diagnosed schizophrenia, was held in solitary confinement for 11 days how he was found with over 50 bruises, restrained on his stomach, and pepper sprayed with a spit hood, all of which is against ministry policy and has the potential to be fatal. How an eyewitness, who was described by the police as credible, saw more than just a physical altercation. And how after two lengthy police investigations and an internal ministry investigation, we're left with no clear answers. So, to finally answer the question, Who gave the fatal blow? Well, the guards did. And the jail did. And the police did. And the Ontario government did. All of these players had some role in Suleiman's death, either directly or indirectly. Suleiman Fakiri wasn't a footnote. Hell, he wasn't even a convicted inmate. His story should be a wake-up call for what can happen when someone with a mental illness falls through the cracks. There are individuals right now, as you're listening to this, who are in our jails that do not belong there. And unless our government radically reforms our correctional system, this will keep happening. Remember the question you asked me you wanted to ask Uncle Yusuf? Don't be shy. You don't want to be shy, Fox? (laughs) This is something Suleiman's four-year-old niece, Fatima, said to us early on when we met the family. And it's a question that's driven me throughout this entire story. What's the question you always ask me? Um, about how my, about why my uncle got sent to the Lindsay jail and why didn't he get sent to a hospital when he was all like injured and bruised and stuff like that. Perhaps it's just that simple. If Suleiman had been sent to a hospital instead of a jail, like the judge had ordered, maybe he'd still be alive today. Because his story wasn't an anomaly. It's a pattern. Ashley Smith, Cleve Gordon Geddes, Moses Beaver, Jordan Sheard, Abdurrahman Abdi, Sean Spaulding, Edward Snowshoe, Justin St. Amour, Justin Struthers, Abdurrahman Ibrahim Hassan, and many more. Maybe we've made it too easy for our government to turn a blind eye on corrections. But one thing's for sure, the Fakiri family refuses to make it easy. While anxiously awaiting the coroner's inquest, their coalition, Justice for Sully, continues to advocate for mental health and institutional reform in corrections. I make sure I say names from across the nation, because there is many Sulaymans. And so, the movement has evolved in that way. It was not done in any calculating way. I'm a very simple man. Um, I am not a gifted mind like Suleiman. I'm just a fighter. Um, and I'm overwhelmed and humbled where the movement is today. It, it's, it's fitting that um, whenever you're able to distinguish Solomon's like grave, it's the, the biggest tree on this, uh, if you look. Really? So that's like, I always know like to come here and stuff, so. Every Friday, Yusuf pays a visit to Suleiman's grave. 
This is this entire area is called Paradise Gardens. So this is all like uh, all of this and that side as well. My late uh, great grandmother is buried there. Wow. Yes. Suleiman rests in a graveyard 15 minutes away from his family's home. We find his grave next to a tall oak tree. The sun is just about to set. If you look at the name of the fami family, Fakir in Arabic and Farsi means poor. Poor in the face of God. And um, it's a fitting last name because, you know, although he was such a gifted mind, he truly was faqir in so many ways. His gravestone is not ornate or grand. It's a simple bronze plaque on the ground with a crescent moon and star, a common Islamic symbol. The plaque reads, In loving memory of Suleiman Fakiri, you are loved beyond words and missed beyond measure. Assalamualaikum, bro. I miss you, bro. I watch as an older brother speaks to his younger brother and makes a promise. A promise I know he intends to keep. I hope you know there are many people that are fighting for you. You're not forgotten. I love you, Sully. I hope you know I will never stop fighting until I leave this earth to get justice for you. I promise you. I promise you, my brother. I give you my word. Unascertained is written and produced by me, Yusuf Zine, and Kevin Young. Kevin Young is also our audio engineer. Our story editor is Michelle Shepard. Our intern is Selena Gallardo. Our legal counsel is Willa Marcus. Katie O'Connor is our producer for TVO Podcasts. The executive producer of Digital for TVO is Lori Few. The executive for Current Affairs and Documentaries for TVO is John Ferry. Theme song and music by Blue Dot Sessions. Unascertained is produced by Innerspeak and TVO. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I had a little trouble with the phone here, apparently. Oh. Are you hearing me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Uh, so, yeah, I just thought I'd contact you and just, just whether or not you guys actually have all the information. I worked in that same unit for over two and a half years. I'm no longer with the ministry. Listening to this uh, podcast, I thought I can speak to this now.